Good evening, and welcome to Full Moon Matinee. I'm your host, The Detective, bringing you the finest crime dramas and film noir from the golden age of Hollywood. Now, as I've been recently perusing through my catalog, it dawned on me that I have not yet brought you a Barbara Stanwyck movie. Uh, well, that gross injustice will be corrected right now. Tonight's picture is from 1950, The File on Thelma Jordan, starring Barbara Stanwyck, Wendell Corey, and is directed by Robert Shodmack, and is uh, the director of photography is George Barnes. Now this picture is certainly considered to be a noir classic. You know, anyone who's been a fan of the genre for longer than a day is certainly well aware of this picture. But for people in my age bracket, and I'll speak for myself, my first knowledge of Barbara Stanwyck was when she played in the TV series The Big Valley. She had the role of the family matriarch Victoria Barclay. Uh, it aired in primetime from 1965 to 69 on ABC, but I remember watching it in after school reruns. You know, it was, uh, you know, you come home from school, get off the bus, run in the house, and you flip on the TV, and it was a very common show to see in reruns, say between four and six o'clock in the afternoon. And uh, because of that, you know, it wasn't until I grew up and started watching old classic movies that I was ever aware that, yes, at one time, she used to be much younger and something of a gorgeous dame. <laughs> but I'll go over more of her bio a little later. Now, Wendell Corey, uh, he was born in Dracut, Massachusetts, and this is an interesting tidbit. Among his ancestors are U.S. Presidents John Adams and John Quincy Adams. Now, Wendell, he was in many films from the late 40s to the late 60s, roughly a 20-year span. Certainly, his best-remembered one was when he appeared in Alfred Hitchcock's Rear Window. But he did do a fair number of noirs, of course. Among his noirs, uh, his first one was Desert Fury. He was in Sorry, Wrong Number. And that one, he worked with Stanwyck in that one. That one was actually their first time working together. But he also appeared in The Big Knife, The Accused, Hell's Half Acre, and of course, Tonight's Picture. So, from 1950, The File on Thelma Jordan. Let's roll the picture. everywhere. Something must have come up, Pamela. There's nothing to worry about. Maybe he's with the DA. Well, it's about time. 
Your wife's on the phone. Tell her to forget it. What's the matter with you? Where have you been? Yes, Pam, I'm listening. Why does he do this to me every time Mother and Father are here? I phoned everywhere. Even that nasty place across the street. What is it, Al's bar? Now, you know, Cleve doesn't drink. He wouldn't be hanging around there. He works too hard, that's all. Probably forgot it. She has her dear father, the judge, there. What's she want me for? Did someone come in? Is there someone there, Miles? Now, oh, look, Pam, I don't like to butt in. But did it ever occur to you that Cleve might like to celebrate an anniversary with just you yourself sometime? I know how he feels. Especially about father, but it's only once a year. Yeah, Christmas and birthdays and Fourth of July and Thanksgiving, April Fool's Day and every other day in the year. Now, look, Pam, there's really nothing I can do. Well, if he is drunk, you can just tell him not to bother coming home at all. Not till father's gone anyway. The children are here. The cake was brought in. They sang happy anniversary to you. I'm sorry, Mel. Unforgivable. Unforgivable. Why you let him get away with it? Please. I'll be in in a minute. You're a dog, that's all. Fed up. Ever heard that phrase? No, you wouldn't. You're not married. If you ever did fall a smart cookie like you, you'd pick an orphan. This is a little awkward, Cleve. You know how I like Pam. You know how I like Pam. Well, then. I can't talk till I have another drink. Okay. But you ought to work up to this. I have. Five years. Five years drunk and I didn't know it. Well, what happened today? Where have you been for the last few hours? Down in the pike. Yeah? Well, not that part of the pike. There are some respectable sections. I went down to an antique shop. Yeah? Other part of the pike, I wouldn't know what to do. Go on, don't bear your soul. For Pam's anniversary present. She told me where it was, a uh, whatnot she's been wanting. What's a whatnot? Well, it's a thing you stick in a corner, put junk and whatnot on it. Ah, you're taking this too seriously. You're too sensitive. I like doing things for myself. It's my wife, my kids, my house. For one thing, I can tell him not to be there so often. I can tell him to take his big car out of my driveway and his big fat wind bag out of my living room. Now, what's this got to do with the whatnot? Well, it does sound sort of picky, you know. It's the basis of it, really. I drove down and went in. No whatnot. The Honorable Calvin H. Blackwell, retired, bless his retired soul, has just been in this morning and bought it for his daughter for her anniversary present. Though so she happened to mention to him that she wanted it, too. Does it all the time. I can't get something for her. Father will. Hey, going someplace? I've got to meet a train at 10, that witness that's coming in. Want to come with me? No. Well, then I've got an idea for you. If you're not going home. I'm not going home. Go out and get yourself really drunk. And if there's a dame handy, tell her how your wife doesn't understand you. It's not bad. They say it helps sometimes. How my father-in-law doesn't understand me. I think I'll do it. Look, Cleve, everything will be all right in the morning. You've got too much to lose to let go now. That Denham trial going to the jury tomorrow. The DA is counting on you. And I'm his fair-haired boy. You didn't remind me of that. And who got me my job as a district attorney? Who put me here? Well, close up when you go, will you? Yeah, sure. I beg your pardon. Mr. Scott, it was nice of you to wait for me. I phoned earlier in the hope that you would. Oh, I didn't wait for you. 
Do you always work so late? But then crime doesn't stop on the dot, so I suppose you can't either. Aren't you going to ask me to sit down? Won't you? In fact, I wish... I wish so much of crime didn't take place after dark. It's most unnerving. It's about my aunt, Miss Vera Edwards. I imagine you know her. Most everyone does. She's a character around here. Uh, am I disturbing you at something? Obviously, I am. But don't do that on my account. After a long, hard day, if a man can't have a drink, or several drinks... Oh, I'm drunk. Extremely, thank you. Wouldn't you feel better? It's awfully stuffy in here. I'll manage. Would you rather I'd come back? Only this has happened before. I don't seem to be able to get any satisfaction out of the police. I phoned you two weeks ago, that first gear we had. This is not the police department. Yes, I know. What I meant to say was there are reasons why I have to stay away from them and come to you. My aunt is eccentric and uniforms upset her. Mr. Scott... Is that what you want to do? Or is it that you just don't want to listen to me? What's your name? Thelma Jordan, Miss Edwards' niece. Well, Miss Edwards' niece, I am not Mr. Scott. So you can save your breath. Oh. However, if I can be of any help, a lady in distress, a pretty lady. Distress is my specialty tonight. You help me, and I'll help you. Do I make myself clear? No, not quite. And now, if you'll excuse me. Uh, wait. Another time, I'll hope to find Mr. Scott here and tell him my troubles. I'm sorry if I disturbed you. Oh, you didn't disturb me. I was just about to go out and find myself a dame. If you'll pardon the expression. Good luck. Thank you. Uh, Miss Jordan. Is that right? I used to know your aunt. She caught me stealing oranges in her orange grove once. Did you ever get switched with an orange branch? I still got the scars. Ruined my legs permanently. I noticed that you have not had the same experience. I've only been here a few months. I've passed the orange stealing age, and I haven't yet reached the flattery one. Good night. Uh, I was just trying to make a joke. Wait a minute. I'm a public servant. I'm supposed to hear your troubles. You listen to my troubles and I'll listen to yours. And wait a minute. At least let me apologize. Anything I can do? If this isn't typical. I come all the way down here to report an attempted burglary and I get a ticket. Not only do I find a drunk sitting in a chief investigator's office, but I... The other cars don't have one. That one's mine. Well, will you move it, please, so I can get out of here? Miss Jordan, I'm really a very respectable citizen. But you see, I've got my troubles too tonight. My name is Cleve Marshall. I am 35 years old and assistant district attorney. So? Well, I'm not just an ordinary drunk. See how fair this hair is? Promise of a most brilliant future. What is it you want of me? Buy a drink someplace. I'm harmless. And I'm lonesome. Well, you're very appealing, but... Thank you just the same. Aren't you interested in men with futures? I have my own to look after. Miss Jordan, at least let me pick that ticket for you. Oh, would you? That's very kind. See how handy it is to know a man of influence? <laughs> Just for that, I suppose I ought to have one drink with you. Good, back it up and we'll In go. here on the condition that I drive. If you insist. the boss. I'm glad you said that because 
I'm no... I'm no dame, remember? So suddenly, I just don't understand it. He didn't have anything but coffee. That's what you think every time you got up to play the jukebox. That's what happened. Come on, mister. It's closing up time. Beach to it, didn't I? Oh, there she is. One more dance. Not now, Cleve. It's late. Isn't she wonderful? It's our anniversary. How long has it been? Three hours. I'm going to buy you an anniversary present. I got the money, right? Here. The check has been paid. Let's go. Would you get the car, please? It's not until the music is finished. Can't let the music go to waste. Can't let anything beautiful go to waste, can we, somebody? The minute you walked into that I office... I know, I, I know, but... No buts, ands, ifs, whereas isn't here to force. Party of the first part? I love you, Thelma. Or have I said that before? You have. The music has stopped. Well, why don't we get out of this cheap joint? Thank you. You're welcome. I'd hate to have his head in the morning. You can try it on now for size if you like. Cleve. Cleve. Thelma. Pretty Thelma. Thelma was a light brown. Oh, hater. let's not start that again. Not even that I'm in love with you? Not even that. Get out, Cleve. I haven't told you my troubles yet. They'll have to wait. Please, Mr. Marshall. You called me Cleve before. One minute I feel like Cleve, the next Mr. Marshall. Which way do you feel now? Mr. Marshall or Cleve? I don't know. Except I'm sorry. No, you're not. Neither am I. Maybe I am just a dame and didn't know it. Maybe I like being picked up by a guy on a binge. Can't you believe that things happen when you're in love? What's time? Day? Year? Oh, I'm sorry. I can't say it that conveniently. That's just what it is, a binge. No relationship between yesterday and tomorrow. That's all there is. There isn't any more. Get out, Cleve. That kind of sobered me up. You'll be all right, then. You'll drive home to whoever is waiting for you. Good night, Cleve. If I told you there's no one waiting for me? I wouldn't believe you. Drive carefully.
Cleve. Where were you on the night of May 25th? Oh, Cleve, it's inexcusable. I'm glad I didn't buy you that whatnot. It's horrible. You're just trying to change the subject. Where were you? Cleve. No ticket this time, not wedged in. I I just waited. I uh, see you brought protection. Did you come down to see Scott? And you, worrying about you if you got home all right. Oh, sure, you know, drunks and fools. What did he say about your prowlers? He's sending out a plain clothes when he promised not to alarm Aunt Vera. Since it's her jewels that are in danger, don't you think she should know? Well, I explained that to you. I guess you've forgotten a lot about last night. Well, you don't like me in the daytime. I didn't say that. My crystal ball was right. You are married. You're way mad. I'm not. Only I'm embarrassing you. This is a small town, I understand. I guess I got a little out of hand last night. I apologize. Accept it. So long, Cleve. Be seeing you. Bye. have the car. Oh, around eight, I thought. I'd like to get an early start. It'd be easier on the children. Father, here's Cleve now. I'll call you back. Goodbye. Is something bothering you? Nice homey reception. You often threaten to do it, but I never thought you would. Leave you, Cleve. Is that what you think? After I fight this morning, I come in to find you packing. What else might I think? Only that I love you very much. not me. June 1st to September 1st, every year. The beach? It's not June 1st yet. No, but Mrs. Perkins said we could have the house early. Gives us an extra weekend. Wasn't it nice of her? Why don't you change, darling? I'll tell Esther we can eat in the patio. We can barbecue if you like. Pam, let's not go to the beach this year. Not go? Well, it's a nuisance, really. Sunburns, worrying about the kids in the water all the time. Long drive for me back and forth weekends. You sound as though there's some blonde after you and you're frightened. Why did you come down every night? Sixty miles and too much night work. Besides, I don't like this house when you're not in it. That's the sweetest thing you could say. But of course we're going. Children love it so. We have to think of them too. We can't be selfish. Anybody else you want me to call before I go? About what? About dinner. You look like a lost penguin. Some of the boys from the paper are taking us out. If you'd care to join. It'd be safe. Well, don't forget those two dues for Mrs. Marshall. I wrote them down on your message sheet. Mrs. Marshall called to remind you to stop the milk order, get yourself a new pair of bathing trunks, Bring down a beach ball for Timmy Friday, eat three square meals daily. She thinks of the inner man. 
And phone garden 8409. I don't know what that last one's about. Somebody took it while I was out. Well, bye now, we're on the date. Good night, Dolly. Thanks. These fruits are not heated or artificially colored, but are from nature to consumer. Gift packed in gay Mexican and Chinese baskets or traditional California redwood boxes. There's a phone call for you, Mr. Thompson, that detective. Thank you. Excuse me, Aunt Vera. Who? Who's calling, Thelma? Where's the rest of it, Sydney? Doctor or no doctor, I want my brandy. Hello, Mr. Thompson. Case of mistaken identity. This is Cleve Marshall. Oh. Hello, Cleve. I've no excuse for calling you, none whatsoever. It's just one of those things. 24 hours a day, lonesome, and they are not well. In fact, Time's been full of emptiness since a certain May 25th. Oh, no. No, you can't. Not very well. Not here. If you want, I'll meet you down on the road in about 20 minutes. Yes, well, uh, thank you for calling, Mr. Thompson. After painting scenery that summer, I stayed on at Lake Placid. It's even more wonderful there in the wintertime. I got a job at the hotel as a hostess. Oh, strictly the genteel kind. Doing what? Tennis, bingo games, bridge. I make a great extra partner. Fill in at anything if I'm needed. If a drink makes you feel like this, you better leave it alone. No. You asked about my past. You should get to know her. The pleasant, refined Miss Jordan. Seen everywhere during the season. Lake Placid, Virginia Beach, Saratoga, promoting other people's fun. Great talent for it. What a life. Don't be dour just to share the moonlight with. Gouty old gents. I haven't had the gout lately. You like to dance? Oh, please, it's just that I'm so tired of being on the outside looking in. It'll wreck of me finally. And here I am again, doing the same thing with you. Did you say dance? Shall we have a drink at the bar first? I'd love to. Sorry, another time. Waiter. Yes, sir. Check, please. Can we go out that way? If you're in a hurry. Yeah, that'll cover it. Thank you. evening. That low gear you threw us into. Who came in there? Was it your wife? No, she's away. Temporarily or just for the season? I'm sorry. Well, you know where I live and where I walk in the evening. I don't care what happens. I've got to see you off. Tomorrow? Tomorrow's Friday. That's no good. Monday, I'll call you. All right, but be careful. Not as Mr. Thompson again. Who's he? The plainclothesman Scott sent out. All he did was advise me to have Sydney live in the house for protection. Some protection. But as there's been no more trouble, say your uh, old Mr. Smith or Mr. Brown. How about Dick Tracy? <laughs> well, it's for your sake. I know. Well, good night, Mr. Tracy. You know, you haven't kissed me once this evening. Yes, I have.
scared me. I didn't mean to. I hate being a knaves dropper. What are you... What are you doing here? Don't worry. I haven't been up there. My phone, you were out. I knew you'd be along soon. Who was that? Let me quiet him. You wait. Sure. Sure, I can wait. she let you down, but you let her down, you should have told her. You can't just say to your wife, don't leave me alone, I'm falling in love with another woman. If it's true, you should have said it. It's true. So you said that first night. That's the difference. I'm drunk now. I wasn't then. Somebody will be coming up in a moment, as usual. Some I'm not going down there this weekend. I can't stand those weekends anymore. Don't you think I feel guilty, too? Not daring to say your name to a soul, pretending you're a dozen other people? Oh, Cleve, what horrible luck. Just when everything I hoped was going right for me at last. So sick and coming out here to recuperate. <laughs> Some recuperation. Head over heels with a man I can't even be seen with. Parking spots like a couple of teenagers. And... I told you. Come on, we're being driven out of here, too. Head over heels? That doesn't say you love me. I only know I think of you all day and all night. What I'll wear so you'll look at me with that look in your eyes like now. What I'll say to you, I can't see you anymore. And what I'll do the next time you take me in your arms. Isn't it up to me to take the chances? Not entirely. I'm married, too. I don't think I heard you right. Just that. I'm married. I'm interested if you feel like telling me. It isn't much of a marriage not like yours. His name is Tony. What's the last name matter? I met him in Florida a year ago at a roulette table. You still love him? much I want to tell you, you won't let me. Remember I told you once I wanted to be an actress? Well, it was all part of that glamour, I thought. Having a certain kind of attention paid to you, the, the right table at expensive restaurants, dark blue tuxedo, black fedora hat, gold cigarette case. That's a good thing to get married for, a gold cigarette case. I don't expect you to understand. I don't understand myself. It was all shiny. Until you opened the cigarette case and found someone else's name inside. To Tony from Dimples or Debbie or someone. And then you ran into him. Out with them someplace. How long did you stay with him? He stayed with me until my money gave out. Where is he now? I don't much care, thanks to you. Wherever he is, there's money, gambling, and beautiful women. Have you seen him lately? No, and I don't want to. 
I'll be free of him someday, I suppose, but there's nothing to be angry about, Cleo. You ought to feel sorry for me. You've got to say it differently. But you don't think of him anymore because of me. I've said that. Again. I don't think of him anymore because of you. We've got to go away together somewhere. Could you... Could you manage soon? Friday. I'll say I'm going up north to see the state's attorney. We'll take the evening train. People will see it. But I'll only say I'm taking the train. We'll go in your car. Edwards resident. Uh, Miss Jordan, please. Uh, this is Mr. Johnson calling. I'll see. One moment. My driver. Isn't it time? Thank heaven you phoned. You've got to come at once. Something's happened. No, no, no. Don't talk. Just come. I'll meet you down on the road. Please, please use the side gate.
What is it? Cleve. I think I know. Tony's shown up. No. Why would you say that? Well, if it isn't Tony, what is it? You thought of him first, too. So did I. Oh, it's Aunt Vera. I was all right till you came. I don't know what's the matter with me. You're all right now. Come on, talk. What is it? She's dead. What? Shot. I was just leaving to get the car out. I heard it. She's on the library floor. The gun beside her, the safe open. Another burglary? She had a valuable emerald necklace. I didn't tell you. It's gone. Some things about Tony, too, you didn't tell me. I don't know. If he were broke or desperate, maybe. I, I don't know. I'm afraid. Don't go there, Cleve. Why not? You don't seem to understand why I'm afraid. There was a letter I wrote to him once, ages ago. I said Aunt Vera might be his type. She had emeralds. If they find that letter... It didn't mean anything, did it, Cleve? Just... just female, nasty. I don't know whether it meant anything or not. I don't know, Tony. Maybe I don't know you either. I suppose I had that to look forward to. I'm sorry, darling. I know how you feel. But don't you see, if it was Tony, they'll suspect me too. Every place we've been, every phone call we've made. We've been careful. We're not going to let them suspect you. Then tell me what I should do. What you should have done a half hour ago. Go back in, scream, call the police. Where's Sydney? Out back, their house. Did he know you were leaving? No. What are you waiting for? I was hoping you'd tell me to do something else. You didn't do anything else. You didn't change anything in there. A little. How little? I rubbed off all the fingerprints. You what? I was panicky. I didn't know what to do in case they were Tony's prints. And yours along with them. I know I shouldn't have. Dozens of times you've been in that room from where? The window where he came in, the gun, the safe. Burglars wear gloves, done jobs like that. It's standard equipment. It didn't occur to you. Not until later when I'd calmed down. So you go around and make it look like a nice inside job. What else? I don't think. I, I don't know. Did you touch her? No. How was she lying? Face down. You didn't turn her over. How did you know she was dead? I could tell she wasn't breathing. You've got to go back and do it over. I couldn't. Your fingerprints on the safe where you looked. Found the jewels were gone. On the body. Cleve, I can't. Maybe I wasn't close to her, but I... I liked her. And that room. It smells of death. It's... I'm going with you. No. No, I, I won't let you take that chance. I'll do it. And make more mistakes? No. You wait for me by the side door in case someone comes up. I'll go douse the lights. If you should get involved in this... I won't get involved. I'd like to be sure where Sydney is, though. You can only see their house from upstairs. Why is the light out in here? I turned it out after I cleaned up. Was it on when you came in? No. Unhurried killer. Turns the light out when he leaves. Are you sure? No, I'm not sure. Okay, leave it dark. But put your prints back on the switch in case you took them off. Go on! Fired. Hers? I never saw it before. Put her down. Now turn her over. Cleve. Wouldn't that have been your first instinct if you hadn't thought of Tony and the emeralds? Aunt Vera, Aunt Vera. Turn her over. Go on. When Scott's man was here, did you tell him the safe was in this room? Yes. What happened those first two times? The side entrance was broken into. The next time we just heard somebody out back, the dog barked. Where's the dog now? At the vet's being bathed. You didn't think it might be Tony before? No, but... But what? 
Well, when I saw the necklace was gone and I remembered, not many people knew about the emeralds. All right, get your prints back on the safe. Put your hands on, natural curiosity. Is there anything left in there? Some more papers, it looks like. Papers? A will by any chance? Who is her heir? Maybe you're a rich woman. No, Cleo. No, she can't have her. Might be tough for you if she did. What would it look like? Forget it. She'd have told you about it, I guess. Yes. Yes, anyway, she wouldn't have. After I've gone, give me ten minutes. And scream and run for Sydney. Cleve, it may be days before we see each other. Turn on the hall light and don't forget to take off that coat. Oh. What is it? I just remembered I left a note upstairs on her night table. Get it, hurry. What's this doing here? Oh, I, I was carrying it when take, I... Unpack it after I've gone. Can I see Sydney's house from that window? Yes. It's all right, it's dark. Edwards is asleep. Her phone isn't connected up there. Certainly, Doctor. It'll take a few minutes. I'll call you back. He's coming over. When I called you earlier, how did you know Sidney wasn't on that phone? We haven't time. He's turning on the light. Something's happened, you said. That's all he had to hear. That was nearly an hour ago. Where was he? Where were you? I don't know. Please. I called twice. First time he answers. Cleve, will you go? Which way will he come in? I don't know. Get to the window. Catch the sill fast. Cleve, the lock on the window has been forced. Did you shut the door when we came in? No. Oh, 
We got some good suspense going on now, don't we? Now, here's another interesting piece of trivia for you. Uh, the two kids, Cleve's two kids that we saw early on in the picture here, those kids are Wendell Corey's real kids. Yeah, he was able to get his own kids in on the picture here. Now, director Robert Schodmack, uh, he was born to a Jewish family in Leipzig, Germany. Uh, he began his career over there. But in 1933, after Hitler came to power, he fled to France. In 1939, with World War II starting to loom on the horizon, he in turn came to the United States and continuing his career here. Now, he directed over 60 films, 12 of which were noirs, more than any other director for the genre. In fact, he was best remembered. He was always thought of as a noir director and also something of a thriller specialist. Among his best known, uh, his first one was Phantom Lady, uh, Christmas Holiday, and The Suspect. All of those were from 1944, and the last two I've already brought you here to the channel. But he also known for 1946's The Killers. For that one, he was nominated for an Oscar for Best Director, 1948's Criss Cross, and of course, tonight's picture. Now, George Barnes, uh, the director of photography, he was well known for doing great work with lighting, camera angles, and especially in urban scapes. You know, all of the elements that are crucial for a noir. Now, his career started way back in the silent era and continued up until the early 50s. So tonight's film was something in the twilight of his career. He did over 140 films. He was nominated eight times for Oscars, winning once. And that was for 1940's Rebecca. It was an Alfred Hitchcock movie. He was... Uh, he won that, it was, see back then they split categories. It was the best cinematography for a black and white. See, they had a separate color, uh, separate category for color back then. So, well, let's get back to the file on Thelma Jordan. I'll get it. Hello? Hello, Miles. Oh, but Cleve isn't feeling well. He was supposed to go up north last night. Oh, can't you leave him alone for one day? Well, all right, but he's on the beach sleeping. I'll have him call you back. I'll take it. It's ridiculous the short time you have down here. It's Miles. Hello, Miles. Don't you ever read the morning papers? Front page. Big. Vera Edwards? Vaguely. Why me? I work in courtrooms, remember? $200,000 involved. Emeralds. And a recently rewritten will. All right. Her house, what's the address? Yeah. It'll take me a couple of hours, okay? Bye. You don't love me anymore, like Father says. Father knows best. Pete, don't brush me off like that. You're not yourself lately. I can't keep track of you. Once I have you down here... And... Business before pleasure. You could have said you're sick. You are. Feeling better now. You look better. I think you were just lying around waiting for an excuse. Oh, you have company. With trappings. 
Oh, Cleve, I'm sorry. I asked him for the weekend because I thought you weren't going to be here. When I woke up and you were, I... What's the use? It's all right. Works out Hello, perfectly. Jimmy. Hello, Joni. I have you know work. Grandpa was coming? You have Jimmy. father to complain to. I don't anymore, Cleve. I'll bet not. What do you talk about, then? It's past talking now. He already knows how distant you are. Preoccupied. How little I see of you. If I didn't know you so well and love you so much, I'd... What? I'd think as he does. That you're playing around. You have no courage, have you? Father says, father thinks. All right, I'll say it. There is someone, isn't there? Yes. Have you known her long? I don't want to talk about her. You don't want to marry her? I'm trying to be very grown up about this, Cleo. What is it? Still father's little girl. Hair ribbon, shorts. I know that's my trouble. I know it. But do you want to marry her? I'm married to you, the children, and the years. You haven't answered my question. I can't divorce a child. That isn't what I want to hear. <laughs> yes, Pam. I still love you. Then what? Got to give me time. I'm all mixed up. Pamela, aren't you coming out to say hello? Please, please don't leave me. I love you. Miles is waiting. I'll call you. When tonight? In a day or two. A tall man. Well, have the lab man dig those prints out and bake them. Right. What have we got so far? Between six and six two. It's about 170, 190 pounds. Right heel worn down, drives a car a lot. Go on, Miss Jordan. I've told you all I can think of. When I was in trouble, I naturally thought of her, my mother's sister. I had nowhere else to go. I was in ill health without funds. I think after a while she was glad. I, I did little things for her. Fixed her hair in new ways and read to her. I was companionship she hadn't had for a long time. And so she changed her will. That's what you keep telling me, but I had no knowledge of that. Do you know to whom the money was bequeathed in the original will? I didn't even know there was a will. To the county, Miss Jordan. There was to be a park in her honor. I'm sorry about that. It's not my fault. Well, don't be too sorry. There may still be that park. Mr. Scott. In your dealings with me, you're questioning your suspicions. Don't be sarcastic. I'm not a criminal. Don't treat me so. You almost have me apologizing. But I'll control myself. We're trying to get that call for you upstairs. Thanks. Got your call for you now, Scott. Thanks. You tune in on the pantry. And Cleve, may I speak to you for a minute? You wait for me in the sun room, Miss Jordan. What do you think? It's too early. What about those footprints? I don't think they were the burglars. I don't think there was a burglar. Cozy her up. See what you can get out of it. Cleve. One moment, please. Be careful. They're going to arrest me, aren't they? Scott isn't going to make a mistake like that. Don't lie. But why? What happened? I don't know too much myself. Except whoever was here last night. Apparently wasn't Tony. But how? 
I haven't even told them about him. You didn't have to. All that fuss and panic last night for nothing. He called you this morning from Chicago. Tony? Are you sure? Laredo, that's his name, isn't it? Scott told me when I came in. One of the detectives got the call and reported it to him. Well, if he did call, why? It'd be a good thing to establish an alibi. Another thing. Auntie's dead. Nice fat will. Wouldn't he be interested in that? Want to pick up again? But that still doesn't mean anything. There are planes he could have made it by this morning. That's what Scott's getting the final report on now. He's had the Chicago police on it for hours. If his alibi is good. What else did they find out about him? For one thing, that you're not married to him. Never were. Why did you lie to me? I was ashamed. I couldn't tell you the truth. Why did you have to tell me anything? I don't know. You forced me. It was always your wife, your strings. I was sick of it. All right, it's still my wife, my strings. I know, I know. That's what makes this whole thing so... Oh, Cleve, we haven't time to quarrel. I'll do anything possible. Anything. A lawyer first, I guess. But I haven't any money. I'll take care of it. I'll pay you back. Don't talk like that. There's a man in San Francisco. Kingsley Willis. He's the best. Even more than that. You have to do more than that. What more? You know how my hands are tied. Things are too close now for comfort. Cleve, suppose the district attorney turns it over to you. He won't. He's not going to let a thing like this get away from That's what I mean. He'll be after me. You won't. Take the case myself. Against you. How better could you protect me? Hold it up, demand more evidence. In the meantime, they'll find out who did it. In the meantime, anything can happen. Don't give way. It's something I feel, Cleve. I know. Just because of the will? People... You'll wait there. No signed confession? I'm surprised. Mr. Marshall has been very kind to me. That's because he doesn't know everything about you that I do. Miss Jordan, I've just been talking to an old friend of yours in Chicago. Mr. Laredo. He says he'd like to help you out, but he's fresh out of money right now. Help me? In what? I told him we we're arresting you for murder. There was a burglary last night. Jewels are missing. Oh, we'll find them around. Sydney, want you. There was also a phone call last night. I've been sort of saving you. Tell us, Sydney. I'm sorry, Miss Jordan. That man who's been calling you up lately, who you pretend is a lot of different names. Uh... A number of my friends call me. That, that man you meet down at the gate. Let's just call him Mr. X. He phoned first a few minutes after nine, and we were disconnected. He phoned back and you answered. Uh, something's happened, you said. Come at once. I didn't think much of it at the time, but I do now. And so will a jury. Since 40 minutes later, you were pretending to be asleep. Why, Miss Jordan? I won't say anything else until I see my lawyer. Well, shall we go? May I get my purse and a coat? You may get nothing. Cleve, I'll book her. Do me a favor. Take Sydney down to headquarters so they can get a statement. Sure. Except, you know, she was always sort of strange, secretive. And the way she kept insisting that someone was trying to burglarize the house. Like she was setting up for this one. But still, she was always nice to me. I guess I just still can't believe it. Can you? That's what we have trials for, Sidney. Yes, that's right. It's all over. Well, that was open and shut from the start. <laughs> Not the way the newsboys will play it up. 
I told you we'd get her indicted. Yeah, but have they got enough to convict her? There are fresh fingerprints all over the place. What more do you want? Isn't that right, Mr. District Attorney? Finding those emeralds helped, too. Well, don't you have anything better to do than hang around courthouses? No, not much. I'm just meeting some of the newsmen here. I've got a story to spill. So have we. An indictment. I wish you luck. What's that story? That's Slick Craig's manager. Who's he? Jordan's lawyer, Willis. Kingsley Willis, you got him? <laughs> yes, worse luck. But I'll handle him. Coffee is so good, isn't it, though? Oh, Mr. Pierce, your brother's been calling. He says it's important. Get him back. Yes. Bye-bye. You know, I've been thinking, boss. If you don't feel up to handling this case... Oh, you'll get your break someday, Cleve. You haven't been looking well lately. Fishing's pretty good this time of year. Hunting's good, too. Right here. No, my boy, I like front pages. Well, I just thought I'd ask. Hello, Alex. How are you, boy? How's the ambulance chasing? In the Jordan case? Sure, but she's got a lawyer. You're kidding. Alex, you wouldn't. Are you crazy? You know what a case like this means to me. How dare you? Why, you double-crossing little... I bring you up, put you through law school, and then just for a little limelight... Whose idea was this? You can go to Kingsley Willis. That's the dirtiest... Well, I might be mad with you if you tell me. I'm out. Disqualified. Kingsley Willis hired my brother for his defense staff. How's that for a shrewd move? Why? He's scared of me. He knows I'd cook that dame. I'm sorry, Pierce. Come back here, you eager beaver. Here's your big break. You better be up to it, boy. Because we're going to get her. We got to get her. Pierce is too popular in this town. Carries too much weight with jurors. This marshal, on the other hand, we haven't so much to worry about with him. You thought this all up yourself? No, to be honest. I give credit where credit is due. Your Aunt Vera's friend, Anonymous, the one that sent me 5,000 on account to defend you. Dear Mr. Willis, a smart move would be to disqualify the district attorney by hiring his brother, a local lawyer, for your defense staff. Pierce, the DA, has a strong influence in this town. Commands too much respect from Jews. Friend Anonymous has quite a grasp of things, wouldn't you say? You did take the idea. I like it. It enables me to kill two birds with one stone. It gives me local assistance, which I need. Small-town jurors hate outsiders and a pinch hit prosecutor. I'm partial to second string teams, Miss Jordan. I don't have to work so hard. Besides, Marshall is not so sure that you're guilty, I could tell. He wouldn't have taken it. Oh, don't be idealistic. A job is a job. You haven't asked me once if I'm guilty. Why should I? I know you're not. I don't want to know. That's the way I work. To me, the world is full of innocent lambs. And I'm their lawyer. But aren't there certain things you should know to protect me? Miss Jordan, there are two types of criminals, the conscious and the unconscious. The latter we sometimes call the split personalities. Schizophrenia. That's when the left hand never lets the right hand know what it's doing. Yes, go on. I don't mean that you are schizophrenic, but that we are together. I am the right hand, and I must never know what the left hand has done or is doing. If I should know, I might start feeling guilty, acting guilty. That's rudimentary. I'm quite sure that you can understand that. 
Miss Jordan, if I should be in trouble, if there are any answers that I should know, later on. Are you satisfied? I suppose. And especially in a case like this, when we have so many lawyers on our side. Well, haven't we? Only a lawyer would have thought of that trick. If you're finished with me now, Mr. Willis. Tell me. There's just one thing I would like to know. Who is he? Is he Mr. X? The one they're looking for? Footprints, the telephone call. Split personality, remember? The left hand never lets the right hand know. Okay. I just wanted to know how we stand, that's all. Just how much we could count on him. We can count on him. I haven't been seeing her lately, if that's what worries you. I haven't been home lately because I've been busy. Getting a jury for this trial hasn't been easy. Steve, I went to the bank this morning. You haven't sent me any checks. The teller wanted to record the new balance in my book, too. I see. Five thousand dollars. Did it cost you that to get rid of her, Cleve, or is that just the beginning? Beginning, the end, I don't know. Pam, please stay out of this. It's my problem, too, if she's that kind of woman. The money wasn't for blackmail, if that's what you mean. She's in trouble. I had to help her. Not the usual kind? No. Something else. And you believe her, of course? Yes, I believe her. She's not just taking advantage of the fact you're married, the children, your position. What are you driving at? Well, maybe you ought to find out something more about her. We could. Father put a detective on you. What? I didn't intend to tell you. But what I mean is, we might find out something about her you don't know. What have you found out already? Nothing so far, except you parked with her one night up at Lookout Point. What else? Really? It was dark. She wore a sequined scarf. And that's all he could see, except it wasn't me. Darling, I didn't approve. I haven't spoken to Father since. That's right, Cliff. I'm like them. I can't help you if you don't give me a chance. I don't need any help, thank you. Pam, you better leave. I only wanted to. Goodbye, Miles. It's only that you don't seem to have your mind on this Jordan case. It's the biggest chance you've ever had. I have my mind on it. You wanted more evidence and we gave it to you. The emerald necklace. And still you act like you wanted to get it over with and get away somewhere. That's right. Well, that's different. I'm sorry. But in the meantime, don't muff this case. You must always keep the jury with you. Remember, prosecuting a woman is different. Much more delicate. I'll do my best. You wouldn't like to go over your opening speech? You'll hear it in the morning. Hello, Mr. Scott. Well, tomorrow's the big day, huh? That's right. See you in court. Good luck, Mr. Marshall. The why of this crime, the how, the where, the when, and the what that should be its punishment. Only of the latter have I not yet spoken to you. I remind you, ladies and gentlemen, of the long and arduous procedure of jury selection we have just been through. During that time, to each prospective juror, I put the same question. Do you believe in capital punishment? You particular 12 said that you did. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. Let's get her convicted first, then worry about the penalty. Maybe you said to yourself, she isn't guilty, and I won't have to recommend death. But you will, Mrs. Asher. And all the rest of you, because I'm going to prove to you that Thelma Jordan is guilty. Watch, Mrs. Asher, 
And you'll have no qualms, religious, humane, or otherwise, about this death penalty. I'll expect you to be as cold and unemotional in your verdict as Thelma Jordan was in passing the sentence of death upon her arm. A life for a life. That's all I ask you to remember. The state calls its first witness, Dr. C.B. Griffith. Too long, confused, in that capital punishment angle, the most controversial subject in crime, and you had to hit it. You've antagonized the jurors. Maybe I did get a little wound up. I'll be more careful. I always said I was partial to second string teams. You sure? He couldn't have picked out our juror better if he tried. Mrs. Asher, she hates him. Uncharitable, unchristian. You ought to thank Mr. Marshall in your prayers sometime. I will. Well, we'll be back at it again in an hour for the last session, I hope. How do the press boys feel about it? Well, the case about to close, they're all asking for Mr. X. Who isn't? A one weak point. Why, we ever had to introduce him in the first place. I didn't, certainly. And finding him wasn't my department. I may have handled some things wrong. I'm sorry about Mrs. Asher. But I've been buttering her up lately. And she knows it. So, okay, stop riding me. I didn't ask for this case. I know you didn't, Cleve. I got all the evidence in, didn't I? We'll cook her on that. Well, unfortunately, that's not all it takes. Now, Willis has been too clever combating it. Did you get that this morning? The gun and the necklace could have been hidden in that smudge pot by the fleeing bandit until he could come back for them later. Who would believe that? Except Mrs. Asher. Anyway, Cleve, this afternoon's your big chance. When you get her on the stand with that new ammunition we've got, then you can really tie into her. Don't worry. Let her try and explain away her past. That's all, brother. talking. No blackjacks, no hidden microphones. Come in. Don't go far, Major. Don't worry. He's going to offer you leniency if you confess. They always do that. It's a chance, Jordan. Oh, Cleve. Cleve, I've waited for that. In court, when you look at me with such hate, or don't look at me. I have to do that. Sometimes I think that hate is real, and I can't bear it. Why do you think it might be real? The evidence. It has piled up, hasn't it? Sort of. But I don't believe anything I don't see. I thought maybe that was why you were here, losing confidence in me. No, in myself. There's no guarantee that this is going to turn out all right. It's got to, after all you've done. I know the chances you're taking. I'm frightened, too. Of anything special? Being on the stand the way you're going to have to go after me. If you tell the truth, there's nothing to worry about. I can't tell all of it. What can't you tell? But you, me, Sydney coming in. You're, you're having to get out so fast. That I'm going to handle in another way. What other truth can't you tell me about? I, I don't know. There are things I'm going to have to ask you about your past. That's no mystery. I already told you. The prim repressed hostess in the hotel. Yes, that's right. Then this must be another Thelma Jordan. Gambling raid photos. Miles got them from the Florida police. That blonde gave a phony name. Is it you? No. It's not very convincing. It's not me, Cleve. As I was once, maybe, but not now. Now come, you're quibbling. In the days with Tony, I told you, but not now. The past is a prelude to the future. Didn't you ever hear that, Miss Jordan? For whose benefit have you changed? Miss Edwards? So she'd leave you her money? That's hey, not true. Perhaps we should call you Sarah Bernhardt, Jordan. You told me what you wanted to be an actor. Stop it, Cleve! You 
can't tell me stop it, Cleve, in court. That's why I'm petrified with fear of going on the stand. And I've just begun. What else? No more photos, facts. Coincidental, but still facts. Your shiny life with Mr. Laredo. Odd that wherever it's shown, there's whiffs of blackmail, minor thefts, bottom oh, brawls, my God, You can't hold that against me. The jury will. Clear. Clear, look at me. I'm not like that. I'm not. Unfortunately, the jury doesn't look at you like I do. What are we going to do? A fast call from Mr. X to Mr. Willis. You're taking a chance. Stick with him. Major. Get me where, Mr. Marshall? I could have told you you wouldn't. Calls his last witness, Thelma Jordan. There are no further witnesses, Your Honor. The prosecutor has an objection. I should like to argue, Your Honor, for our right to cross-examine. Right? What right? What law book did you study from? I said to argue the right. How can you argue the right of something that doesn't exist? If the defendant takes the stand to be examined by me, then you have the right to cross-examine, not otherwise. If the prosecutor feels cheated, Your Honor, then it's entirely his own fault. Believe me, there is nothing I would like better than to put my client on the stand. But to subject her to this prosecutor whose vitriolic attack the on this woman... personalities of the prosecution and the defense should be kept out of this, Your Honor. Will you please tell him once and for all? Mr. Marshall. As I'm sure you know, there is no law which requires a defendant to take the stand. She does not have to prove her innocence. Guilt must be proved against her. Thank you, Your Honor. As I was saying, I cannot with conscience subject my client to any furtherance of this trial. There is anyway only one question that I would ask her on the witness stand. Did you kill your aunt, Miss Jordan? But the answer to that is obvious. She could not look at me so clearly. All other questions would be irrelevant. Except one. The question that I see in your eyes, ladies and gentlemen. Just exactly what has the prosecution proved to you? That Miss Vera Edwards was robbed and killed, or killed and robbed, that I don't even know. Beyond that, too, your prosecutor has failed you. Mr. Marshall, at the beginning of this trial, promised you the when, where, why, and how of this crime. The one word he forgot was who. It's the word which circumstantial evidence can never prove. Here we go, Mr. X again. That's the question I see in your eyes, ladies and gentlemen. If she didn't do it, who did? Who did? Even I ask it. Even my client asks it. If I didn't do it, who did? The state has tried very hard to prove to you that no one else could have committed this crime. But I would like to refer you to the state's own testament. May I have the transcript, Your Honor, please? Don't worry, there's no loophole. One of the points the prosecutor made was that as Mr. X had phoned a few minutes after nine, Mr. X could certainly not have been present at the house at the time Miss Edwards was killed because he was killed earlier. Didn't Miss Jordan say to him on the phone, something's happened? Now on the surface, this could seem quite clever of the prosecutor. But I quote now that eminent state medical witness, Dr. Griffith. Question by the prosecutor. Then in summation, you would say that the time of Miss Edwards' death was not earlier than 8 p.m., not later than 9. Answer by the doctor. I can and do between 8 and 9 o'clock, Mr. Marshall. So then, ladies and gentlemen, 
Better say that Mr. X most certainly could have been in the house earlier and called back at nine, couldn't he? He could have been the murderer too, couldn't he? And Thelma Jordan, when he arrived, could have become suspicious that it was Mr. X that killed her aunt. Why else was she in bed later, feigning sleep, sick at heart at her discovery? Why has she been silent so long? Was it out of some loyalty? Or fear? Or because she loves him? Who knows just exactly what is in a woman's heart? But, ladies and gentlemen, if there is the slightest doubt in your mind, if you think for one single instance that somebody else might have committed this crime, even if there was the slightest physical possibility of it, you cannot convict Thelma Jordan. Mr. Rex, who are you? Come on, Jordan. Judgment Day. You win, spit in the prosecutor's eye. Prosecutor, persecutor. And if you get together with your Mr. X fell, bring him around so tough man. Well, Jordan, if you don't come back, we'll miss you. And if you do, well then I'll drive with you over to, to Hatchby. Maybe on the way I'll be able to find out something about you. Honorable Jonathan David Hancock, Judge Presiding. Please be seated. Mrs. Ash has been crying with some hope. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you have reached a verdict. We have, Your Honor. The defendant will rise and face the court. The people of the state of California versus Thelma Jordan, defendant, case 124-1206, 
We, the jury, in the above entitled action, find the defendant not guilty. Take it so hard, it's only a lawsuit. Next time you'll have had the experience. Okay, sir. Now that this is over, couldn't we talk I'll phone you tomorrow. How about a statement, Mr. Marshall? See, Scott. Don't move over the tennis net. Bad sport. You told him the best man won. Didn't we? Don't know what you mean. Maybe. Maybe I'm wrong. you answer. Why? People calling to say they're glad. Then at least take it off the hook. Now answer. I'd like to see how anxious this guy is. Hello, Cleve? Hello? Yes, Cleve. Yes, I... Yes. Yes, they've gone, but you can't come here. No, no, it's not safe. No, Cleve, I'll... I'll meet you somewhere. I'll, I'll let you know in a few days. I... Did he ask you if I was here? No. Why did you have to come here? Weren't we supposed to meet afterwards? Has anything happened to change our plan? Our plan was a long time ago. Not so long. My memory's not that sure, except that I gather our plan has changed. That's why I came back the first time. I didn't like that stall and I don't like this one. I'm not stalling. I just don't want to face him. Or him face me. Which? Why don't you say what worries you? I can't hope to make you understand. I want to get away from here. Mm, naturally. This place has memories. Tony, please. Please don't let him find us here. Why didn't you tell me that night that you were in love with him? wasn't. It was Scott you were supposed to go after. Make him tumble for your charms and those burglaries. And all of a sudden there was a guy named Marshall. Just happened that way. Wasn't it better the way it turned out? Sure. An assistant district attorney. Married. Got kids. That's always the kind. Well, just so you're not in love with him. I'm not. Then what is all this? He's in love with me. And you find that hard to resist. I'm in love with you, too. Especially now. Now that you're rich? Yeah, I suppose that does make a difference. But you brought that on yourself. I only asked you for the emeralds. Instead, I wind up with a lifelong annuity. Do you think I'm going to let that get away from me? I'll sign it over to you. Everything, any deal you want. But we're finished. I'm not going away with you. Uh-uh. That might look like complicity. Later, if you're so anxious to get away from me. But you'll change your mind. Come here a minute, I'll help you change it now. Go down and get rid of him. I don't care how, just get rid of him. Then we're leaving, you and me. And keep in mind, the district attorney would still like to know about those footprints. Who is Mr. X? Thelma, get me the bottle. And you can leave that open. I was worried I had to come. Someone is here. Tell me, yes. Tell me. Come with me, Cleve.
In here, Cleve. In this room where I've told you so many lies. What is it? What's happened? He's come after me. I'm going away with him. I don't believe that. You don't believe anything you don't see. I don't want to talk about the trial. That's over. Why is Tony here? He's part of it. He's all of it. I've always loved him. That's not true. You're lying. No. Listen to me. We've never had much time together. We haven't now. You must have known, except you didn't want to know. Why didn't you put me on the stand? To strengthen your case. You were afraid I'd break down. You knew I would sometime. Okay. I killed her. Right from that corner. I didn't know about the will. I was getting the jewels for Tony. I came out here with that plan. Didn't I, Tony? Go on. Don't let me interrupt you. You could help. It's not easy. She found me at the safe. She had a gun, too. I'd like to say I didn't intend to kill her. But when you have a gun, you always intend if you have to. But you were the fall guy, Cleve. Right from the beginning. Yes, you're right. I suppose, as you said, I must have known you killed her all along. Though I did think it was you. From Chicago, I killed Aunt Vera? Or do you mean she only pulled the trigger? That soothing angle. Whatever the angle. Get out of her life and stay out of it. You don't seem to understand. We started this together, we finished together. You got your chance, Laredo, take it. Otherwise, what? Thumbs been acquitted and can't be tried again, but you can for complicity. And you? Where would that put you, Mr. X? Let it go, Cleve. Don't you see? He sees. That's the convenient part about a fall guy. Once you've got him hooked, you've always got him hooked. Don't believe he had the gun. Your tough luck. It was supposed to be Scott who could destroy evidence. But you were so anxious. Is that true? Get your things. After a nice ocean trip, I thought we'd go to Europe. Paris, the Riviera. How'd you like that? As far away as possible. We'll stop in a few minutes and get a drink. You'll be all right. I'm all right now. Give me a cigarette, Tony. You were right. It was hard, but it's better this way. He's lucky to get off like he did. Yes. He only lost his wife and home. We'll get them back. And what will we get back, Tony? For one thing, yourself. Get the right clothes again. Dye that mousy hair. Get back that sexy look. And what we always had. And better now. No more problems. No more problems. You won't go away from me? I won't leave you. And you won't? No names inside. It's pretty.
know more to say. What about this Tony? How many confessions do you want? It was no accident. No accident, Mr. Scott. Now you've got two confessions. She's confessed everything, except who Mr. X is. Why don't you tell him? I love him. That's why. I couldn't go on with him, please. You did that for me. I'm glad it's over. All my life struggling. The good and the bad. Save your strength, darling. Willis said I was two people. He was right. You don't suppose they could just let half of me die? Doctor. Wasn't much use anywhere, Mr. Marshall. You didn't have to go out. Clave, I knew. I've known for an hour or so. Funny how a few shiny little sequins throw a lot of light. The girl the detective saw you with on Lookout Point. The girl you prosecuted through the case for. I don't have to ask you why. You believed in her. I loved her. Let's put it that way. What are you going to do? I don't know. Go somewhere. Try to start again. I guess you know what it means. Disbarment. No more law practice anyway. I'm sorry. I'll have to report it. I already have. I was with the DA when they found me. I've always liked you, Cleve. Miles, would you phone Pam? I already have. Well, I just wanted to tell her I'll get in touch with her later. That's what she said, too. Later. But she'll get over it. Be seeing you, Cleve. Good luck.
Okay. Now, does it strike you as odd that Cleve's wife here is a little too calm about his affair? I mean, you know, her reaction here, it, it just seemed, or, or lack of a reaction, you know, it's quite unnatural. But we do certainly have some great plot twists here in the end now, don't we? Now, another interesting piece of trivia here is that Stanwick's brother, Bert Stevens, also appears in this picture. It was an uncredited role, but he was one of the defense aides that was seated at her table in the courtroom. Now, Barbara Stanwyck, of course, I got to get to Barbara Stanwyck, right? She was born Ruby Stevens. Barbara Stanwyck is just a, it's just a screen name. She was born Ruby Stevens in Brooklyn, New York, and was the youngest of five children. She was orphaned when she was only four years old, and from there was raised by her older sister Mildred, and at times foster homes, from which she often ran away. <laughs> she was a very poor student, bad grades, and often picked fights with other kids. Um, but later, in later years, when her sister Mildred became a showgirl, that piqued Barbara's interest that now she wanted to also go into show business, and it kind of took from there. Uh, she first started in the Zigfield Follies, from there moved to Broadway, and from Broadway on to film. Now, her first film appearance was as a fan dancer in the 1920 silent film Broadway Nights. But she did appear uh, in 85 films uh, over a 38-year span, okay? All genres. In fact, one of my favorite Barbara Stanwyck movies uh, was a holiday movie, 1945's Christmas in Connecticut. Great film. You know, that's one of those movies I could watch it year-round, not just at holiday time. But of her notable crime dramas and noirs, she was in 1931's Night Nurse, 1933's Babyface, and, and both of those were pre-code. Uh, her first noir, <laughs> this is so funny, her first noir was in one of the most sentinel classics of the genre. She was in Double Indemnity with, with uh, Fred McMurray but of course appeared in many others as well. Uh, she was in The Strange Love of Martha Ivers, The Two Mrs. Carols, The Man with a Cloak, Clash by Night, in that one she was in with Marilyn Monroe, Crime of Passion, you know, and, and just, you know, the list goes on, okay? But toward the late 1950s, from that point onward, she started to morph and evolve into doing television work. In fact, uh, for a time even had her own show. It was just titled The Barbara Stanwyck Show, uh, aired from 1960 to 1961. Uh, it was short-lived, but was nominated for an Emmy. And of course, she did various appearances, you know, as a guest in various episodes of TV series. But of her TV work, you know, the, the best renown was certainly The Big Valley, which I told you about in the opening. And, as always, I thank you for spending the evening with Full Moon Matinee. Stay with us as we continue our further investigations into the long-lost evidence of Hollywood. Until next time. <laughs>